You're at 109 right now. One, two, one, two. Hey everybody, welcome to the IC109 podcast. I'm your host, Larry Wiggs, with my co-host, Big Mike. But he's really the star of the show, so <laughs> let's give it up. Where's is, where is the We're in here. Alright, this is our first, this is our second, second um official videoed podcast. We've done others, but now you get a chance to see us in person. Um, we're doing these in nine minute, um, segments. So, uh, with the equipment and everything that I've got set up, that's how we're going to do this with this segment. I asked big Mike to help me explain this work of art here. Um, it's kind of a demo, uh, work of art. It's not the finished copy, but what happened is it came to me on the day, uh, April 12th, the day that, uh, Nipsey's burial which occurred four years ago on the anniversary, the four, four year anniversary of Nipsey's burial. And this artwork is about Nipsey. So, um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, my favorite artist since 2005, when I learned about him, do some research, check him out, um, painted a painting. And although he had painted thousands of works, I had never seen this one particular uh, work until I was watching a documentary about him in which they showed the painting. And I noticed that Jean-Michel had written or painted uh, the number 109 on that painting. So I was excited. I jumped up, I got, grabbed my um, cell phone camera, took a photo of that uh, painting, did some research into it. Give me a second here. Mike? Yeah, okay, okay, all right. And, um, okay, so, what the heck did I do? I grabbed my phone and then I snow I took the photo and put, I posted it up to uh, Facebook. And when I posted it to Facebook, I realized I had pay, I had posted it or I had snapped the photo and posted it very quickly. And the time at which I posted it was 11:09 p.m. So there in 11:09, there's 109 on the painting. It said 109. So I was immediately attracted and drawn to this painting. And since that happened, um, I've made that my favorite Jean-Michel Basquiat painting, but then it has taken on greater significance to me because I've read more. I've interpreted his artwork in a different way. And I want to share my interpretation here with Big Mike. All right. So let's see. It says across the top going left to right, Nipsey Hussle, the great part two, and there's a copyright sign. What does that mean? All right. So on the original Jean-Michel Basquiat artwork, which is entitled All Color Cast. Uh, Basquiat wrote Alexander the Great. So I changed it to Nipsey Hustle the Great. Not because I want to, you know, pay homage to Nipsey. I do, but because Nipsey called himself the Great. I was in class the other day trying to uh, convince the students that Nipsey had called himself the Great. Um, and I told them to look at his Instagram account. But his Instagram account is entitled Nipsey Hustle. And they were like, ah, shut up. You're not, you're not making any sense. I was wrong. It's his Twitter account. Nipsey Hustle's Twitter account, his title is The Great. So there's a connection between um, Alexander the Great, probably Nipsey borrowed from his title and called himself, you know, put himself in that in that position. So that's a connection right there, but it doesn't stop there. Alexander the Great was a Macedonian or a Greek leader. Nipsey Hussle's brand is called the Marathon. The, a Marathon or the Marathons come from Greece. The legend has it, there was a war in the city of Marathon. There was a, what was it? A marathoner who ran from the war to uh, notify the people that, the, that, there, that they were victorious, that there was victory. So there was... I've already said marathon and I've already said victory um, with re relation related to um, Alexander the Great. If Nipsey Hussle's brand wasn't called Marathon, the Marathon Clothing, the Mar you know, Marathon Collective, 
And if Nipsey didn't name his album Victory Lap, I would have no connection, no association to Nipsey and this painting. But that's, there it is right there. All right, so we go down to the Roman numerals. We have, in Roman numerals, we have a three, uh, a 21, a 31, and 2019. What does that signify? All right. So on the original painting, Basquiat wrote Roman numerals, but he didn't, it, those Roman numerals didn't mean anything. They were just basically uh, gobbledygook just they, they didn't mean anything you can't turn them you can't convert them into real numbers so i decided to take the same idea but give some meaning or significance because i think this painting was about um nipsey hustle so i i took the roman numerals for the date that nipsey was killed uh, march 31st 2019 um and i put that in there and that date is significant Sadly, because Nipsey was killed on that day, but also because the Jean-Michel Basquiat exhibit opened in Los Angeles this year in 2023 on March 31st. So that's the, the parallel between the two. All right. <clears throat> so you have the words drachm, phlegm, and thumb and next to it an arrow with patois. What do those things mean? I think that Jean-Michel was talking about linguistics. First, he mentioned Alexander the Great, but he was, and in that sense, he was talking about history. I think now he's talking about linguistics. And I think Jean-Michel said something like the English language is weird because he lists three words that are spelled differently, but they all have the same final syllabic sound. For instance, the words are drum, phlegm, thumb. All right, so linguistics and patois is a word that refers to linguistics, but it's one of those. It's a it's a derogatory. It's a it's a slighted word to say your your language is not really a language. You know, it's a diminished uh, way of yeah of describing someone's uh, mother tongue. All right, um, there's a crown, and then there's Floyd Joy Mayweather Jr. And the number is 109-2356. Sick. All right. So the crown is emblematic of all of uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's work, but also emblematic of all uh, graffiti artists because the crown was significant, right? Um, so you can't have a Basquiat work without a crown. Basquiat painted a crown in it. I painted a crown. I put a crown on, on this one. Basquiat, in, his, in the original work, wrote the name of a boxer, and he wanted to give pay homage to that boxer. That boxer was Jersey Joe Walcott. Well, today, Jersey, Jersey Joe Walcott is not someone that we uh, know. My grandmother, she's 93 years old. She remembers Jersey Joe Walcott. But today, we don't know Jersey Joe Walcott. So I tried to update um, the work and added a name that we do know. Floyd Mayweather. Apparently, according to Wikipedia, his middle name is Joy. So Floyd Joy Mayweather Jr. I put his name there. Now, what I love about this work of art and why it's my favorite, the original has the numbers 109 in it. You're at 109 right now. Yeah, did. Mike is going to sleep on me, man. All right, so what is the 235? Okay, so when Basquiat created the work, he, according to Al Diaz, Albert Diaz was Basquiat's friend. I interviewed um, Al Diaz uh, last year. He told me that that's a, a, a library, like a um, Dewey Decimal System. It's a library code. Basquiat had just taken a random library code and put it on the painting. But it so happened to have 109 as the first three numbers, which resonates with me, which I love. So the SIC, I think, stands for Standard Industrial Category, Category, Categorization, something like that. Okay. All right, so now we have uh, six next to the word liver with an arrow, seven next to the word lungs with an arrow. Uh, what are those? What's the uh, significance of that? All right, so Basquiat was listing things. He put a six 
and rolled liver, and then you put seven and you listed lungs. The number six and the number seven, well, I can't say that that has any significance or any correlation to Nipsey directly. Um, I think I can make up something, but overtly, you know, instantly, it doesn't speak out to me. But the words liver and lungs, but there's also the word chest in there. The point is, or the, the correlation is this, Nipsey was shot in his chest and uh, Nipsey was uh, shot in his liver and his lungs. The liver and lungs, lungs are primarily the largest organs in the chest. Well, Nipsey was shot in his chest and in his um, liver and his lungs, according to the Los Angeles Times uh, article that I read. Now, what's really peculiar is also on that um, that painting, the original painting, Jean-Michel Basquiat wrote the number 47. 4 plus 7 equals 11. And according to the Los Angeles Times report, Nipsey Hussle was killed after being shot 11 times. All right. Um, there's a caricature of a man. Uh, what does that mean? All right, we're going to stop right here. We've already, we've already gone a couple of minutes over um, the 10 minute mark. So um, let's come back to the man, the image of the man. All right. All right. You're at 109 right now. You're at 109 right now. I know this is not your place. But it'd be dope if you put a ceiling fan like right up there. You can open the windows on. We're on now. So you want to get back to this conversation? Yes, sir. All right. So uh, when last we spoke, I asked you about the caricature of the man. I'm thinking this is a self-portrait of you. No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back to 109. We already did that. But we have to do it again because for this segment, we have to start from 109. All right. Um, so we have the numbers 109-235 with sick in uh, parentheses. What does that mean? Well, all right. So I talked with uh, Albert Diaz, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's um, best friend, cohort, creators of um, the art uh brand of Samo, right? Co-creator. They were working together, two minds together. Um he, Albert told me that 109-235 in parentheses SIC is a library code that Jean-Michel um, picked up and just randomly posted, you know, uh, on painted on the painting. I'm glad that he put those numbers up there because uh, 109 that resonated with me. So I was like, cool, let's run with it. Now, the way I discovered this is I was watching a documentary one night. I saw 109 on the painting, jumped up, grabbed my phone, took a photo of it and posted about it to Facebook. And when I posted about it to Facebook, it was 11.09 p.m. So in within the time, 11.09 p.m., you have 109. On the painting, you have 109. I have these moments where I just find 109. And I thought that was an interesting correlation. So the fact that he wrote 109 on his painting basically makes this my favorite painting. Um, it's just a random thing, a random happenstance um, that he actually took these numbers and threw them on his uh, painting. But it was peculiar, the fact or the way that I discovered them, you know, that night watching that um, documentary. And um, so that's that. Um, Looked up 109-235 on the Dewey Decimal System. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Not the Dewey Decimal System, but um, Standard Industrial Categories. Categorization. Yeah. 109-235 um, is like um, a metal, like a silver or copper um, on that uh, 
that's the in the the standard industrial categorization or at least metals fall under 109 dash something 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 mm, interesting all right so See, i like i like when when big mike says interesting because the point here is for me to tell these stories but for them to resonate with people somehow and if you think the story is interesting then i'm then i'm getting where i really want to be i want to i want to captivate minds with this story like dang yo did you hear about this check this out this is you know that's what that's where i want it to be that's the start of it so uh below that we have uh livers liver a six uh next to liver with an arrow a seven next to lungs with an arrow and then the word chest what do what do these things mean well the numbers you know not nipsey but um basquiat is listing listing things like uh, as you would find them uh listed in a book uh with a legend you know this is number six and this is what it means and etc etc but the fact that um basquiat wrote liver and lungs is highly significant because i i i make the connection between nipsey and um and Basquiat's painting you see Nipsey was shot in his liver and in his lungs there's also um, a mention of chest the word chest is written uh, by Basquiat in the work the liver and the lungs are located in the chest they are some of the largest organs in the chest cavity so when Nipsey so Nipsey was shot in his liver and in his lungs um I think it's interesting that Basquiat did not write spleen, uh, kidneys, um, or any other organ which he could have, um, but he chose um, liver and lungs. That's directly related to um, Nipsey. And then there's the number 47. 47 is written uh, on the painting by Basquiat. Apparently it was random, but Nipsey was shot 11 times, and 4 plus 7 is 11. Okay, let's see. Uh, you have a caricature of a man. Um, what is this about? So, Basquiat would draw, would make a crude drawing of a person, and oftentimes he would paint himself. It, these would be self portraits. Um, you have the image of a man. For better or for worse however you i mean it's not an exact image it's 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 a very crude um work of a man of a, of a figure of a human figure the uh i was in the class the other day and the students looked at it and they were just like Ugh, that looks like a monkey say is that, that again. a caricature of you say that again uh, is, it, is this a caricature of you no no absolutely not it has nothing to do with me this was Jean-Michel Basquiat's representation of perhaps himself, but I believe and I want to say and I want to interpret this as an image of Nipsey Hussle because... It doesn't look like Nipsey Hussle. It doesn't look like him, but there's a photo of Nipsey taken in Japan where Nipsey, you see his body, and then behind him or near him, you see the number 109. In this photo, you have a picture of a, of a male, what I believe is a male figure, and you have the numbers 109. So that's the correlation, the association I make. So there it is. All right, let's see. Um, you have the word Japan with... Uh, Eritrea. Eritrea. And you have two arrows going towards Japan and one arrow going towards Eritrea. And you have two copyright signs. What does that mean? The copyright signs are, um, that's the convention. You know, uh, Albert Diaz and Jean-Michel Basquiat, when they would sign their tags um, with a SAMO, they would put the copyright sign. It was a cool thing for them to do. That was just, you know, their thing. So that's why that's there. Um, I'm trying to straight stay true to the original artist's, you know, creation. But here's the thing. Um, Jean-Michel Basquiat wrote China on the original painting in this one that in my interpretation and what i'm um bringing forth i put japan well china and japan are both asian countries they're not very far from each other um so in this edition this upgrade 
Um, I'm calling your attention to Nipsey, and I'm saying the photo that Nipsey took in Japan that has 109 on it was taken in Japan. Excuse me. Even though the original was um, China. Now, the reason Jean Michel Basquiat wrote Haiti on his painting, on the original, is because he was from Haiti. At least I believe that's why. Um, even though in this painting he may have been talking about economics and may have been talking about a trade deficit because he mentioned, well, he drew lines, arrows pointing, uh, two arrows pointing away from uh, Haiti toward uh, China and then one from China back to Haiti. So I interpret that as being, hey, uh, the Chinese are maybe um, taking resources from Haiti and returning little uh, to the Haitian people. And I don't think that's far off from the truth in any trade imbalance around the globe with a more powerful nation, you know. Mm. I'm not a uh, scholar of trade imbalances, but I believe the Japanese were more uh, involved with Jamaica than Haiti, if my memory serves. Well, okay. I'm not... Um... I'm not so, here. Who knows if that's even true? But but what I I'm... believe the French were still heavily involved, and the United States is definitely involved in the uh, let's say economic exploitation. Even to this day, the to uh, this day they uh, they recently had four or five uh, government contractors go over to Haiti to try to um, overthrow a popular uh, government and they were caught by some Haitian police officers and the diplomat for Haiti actually escorted them personally to the airport to get them out of the country before they could be prosecuted. Now you and I as expats and more so me than you I've been arrested in several countries and the uh embassy didn't send anybody to do anything for me but let's uh, continue was this like a thigh bone we're, or we're, something we're gonna have to cut down yes it, it, I, who knows what kind of bone it is but i put the a bone femur he's uh he's definitely interjecting or or calling our attention to his the anatomy so in this painting he's talking about um linguistics history anatomy um economics uh you the name cameras it off. yep gotta go you're at 109 right now. All right, that's the end of this section. This this is the end of the uh, the video portion. So we're gonna move into uh, just chopping it the up. The sexual portion. What is this Negro? Run that question by me again. All right, uh, Mr. Larry, is a woman wrong for keeping a baby that the man told her he didn't want? By keeping the baby, meaning she's not having an abortion. It didn't specify, but if you want to add that wrinkle. Because I can't understand why she would say she wants to. Okay, so, okay, whether it's an abortion or whether the baby is alive, the, the woman still has a choice okay if it's an abortion she can she can get rid of the child but if it's the children child is alive she can get rid of the child through uh, adoption those are two ways of, of uh, okay so does that change your answer no all I'm saying is like it for what I what I, what I can speak to or what I'm speaking to the circumstances it could it could occur at two different points in time. That, that, that's all I'm trying to uh, establish. So the point here is the woman has to make a decision to keep the child or uh, or let it go. And she will not uh, seek approval or seek, uh, she will not consult her husband or boyfriend. Husband? Oh, These oh. hoes don't have husbands. 
Oh, this is a. Uh, you think these wayward bras out here have husbands? Out of here. Okay, so what is this? So no, it's just a woman. It could she could possibly have a husband, but most of these uh, bots don't walk around with husbands. They run out footloose and fancy free. I don't know, man. I'm not. I feel as if I'm not. Uh, I feel as if I'm not. I wasn't prepared for this world. Like I can't even. I can't even fathom. You know, a woman. Like when I'm in the classrooms with these students, the behaviors, the things that I hear from the students, just I, I'm, I'm appalled. I, I'm like, I can't, I can't understand how this is natural and normal for these students. Um, it's, it's wild. Now it's not all of the students, but for some of the students, it's like, I never, I never acted, you know, in the fashion that they've acted. Um, I've had, I've always had a, a good network, a good, uh, I was, I was brought up well. My, I had interested parties from living grandparents to uh, parents to a sibling aunts and uncles cousins you name it and the um, behavior that I, I i noticed in the classroom is atrocious now i can only i can only imagine that a student like i can only uh what i can only uh, juxtapose I, I can only uh extrapolate i can only take what you've asked me and imagine that it's one of these students there are some really, you know, bad uh, behaving, um, bad, poorly behaved um, students. So in that case, one of these young women, if, if she had to make a decision, if, if she is unmarried, and uh, yeah, if she's unmarried, it's her life, it's her body. She should have the right to do with it, do with the child uh, what she wants. That's, that's my, my, uh, my thing. Uh, but I think that sadly the, the man, the young boy, is perhaps going to be okay with the woman taking the child and doing with uh, his child whatever because he hasn't been raised to be upstanding, to be, um, you know, nurturing or responsible for, for the child. And he may think of it as, well, whatever and I think that's sad but I, I kind of think from the behavior that I've seen in the classroom like some people might feel that way I think yeah all right so reset the question is a woman wrong for keeping a baby that the man told her he didn't want hell yeah uh, like Larry uh, every day he deals with the remnants of these garbage women making these poor decisions they should do whatever the father wants at best and and hope that he stays around there's no way she should be keeping a baby that he don't want she gonna do take him down to child support and get your 47 dollars a week out of his paycheck you and the state gonna raise this poorly raised baby every every week Larry got to wade through bullshit with these trash children because nobody wanted them. The mama only wanted them for a check and to uh, keep tethers to some dude that don't want her. That's all it is. If the, if the man don't want his baby with you, it's because he don't want you long term. That's what it is, mama. So go on and scrape that baby off and keep it moving. Do the world a favor. Oh my goodness. And here's the thing. I don't think that uh, non-married women should get child support or welfare. Non-married. Okay, they're single. They've had a child. They should not get? No, you should not. You should not. Uh, it, I mean, it should be voluntary. The man wants to pay, he'll pay. But you shouldn't be able to go to a court and want uh, resources legitimately for this illegitimate child. You got a back you you got a backdoor relationship. You get backdoor resources. Whenever he want to drop something off, he drop it off. If he don't, he don't. You shouldn't bother a man with your nonsense. I'm a Libra, and by that logic, I think that's that's a balanced uh, way. 
the Libra is about balance. And you said, you know, ask you. You really aren't because you know the astrology is off by like six weeks. If you uh, count the calendar and then the moon's rotation, not the, the Earth's rotation, uh, our calendar is off by like six weeks. Oh, yeah, because there are there are supposed to be 10 months and there are 12 months and the but, six weeks would count uh, would account for the those two months that we have added uh but okay but anyway um yeah no you okay we have two months and yes today one month is four weeks so actually that would be eight weeks that are are there but you said our calendar is off because of six weeks right yeah but i think it's like over a thousand years it's like off by like a few days and then over the time that has been counted it it adds up to about six weeks but i'm not exactly sure i'm not exactly sure either maybe i'll look it up off air i uh, I was um but the 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 astrology as it is assigned isn't accurate for anybody because the months are off absolutely and it's because we're on this gregorian calendar and not i guess the lunar calendar because romans julius caesar and these the names of the uh the months and the way that they, it's delineated in the gregorian calendar is based upon man okay so let me see all right all right um let's say some some broad came to you and said larry i'm pregnant with your baby and like you don't want anything to do with her because she's ugly and you say well i'm gonna give you like four hundred dollars to go take care of that and she was like i'm keeping your berry larry i love you and you say well i ain't gonna ever go go see this kid this kid is ridiculous to me that's an interesting proposal man that's it's such a sad situation okay would you see the kid if the kid is ugly ugly well okay let's say like it was just uh, like he was just horny and uh you just like found <coughs> oh my you just found some woman and like you feel bad about it the next morning but whatever and she comes up to you nine months later talking about you know i got this horribly ugly disfigured baby i'm about to have would you say okay i'm gonna give you the money to get it scraped or would you be like yeah it's mine i'm I'm gonna take care of it regardless i'm gonna name it larry wiggs the fourth whatever it is whatever slop you plop out i'm gonna go ahead and uh, take care of that oh man such a such a such a terrible question and a quandary like um you know you have to be every breath we take we must be appreciative that we have breath in our body and if our uh likeness if if we are able to replicate our, ourselves god gives us that that uh the power to uh bring another life into this world into this world we should not be frivolous we should not be um you know uh, carelessly having sex, especially unprotected, that may produce a child and and you know a child that we don't you know care for. As men, we have to be we have to protect our seed, and that's an interesting point because Shaka Bars, this dude on um, the internet, uh, I found him on Instagram, and um, he has a million followers, probably more today. He was at Lamert Park one day when I was there with my wife. And we saw him. Um, this guy was talking about uh, injaculation, where rather than spreading your seed or wasting your seed and having sex, then you, uh, you you remain celibate or you you abstain from sex, and then your body reabsorbs the um, the sem- seminal fluids, and it actually helps you produce more testosterone, so that future, so you become stronger. That's bullshit. Don't worry about that. Chris Rock even joked about it. He said, look how ugly he was saying. Look how ugly Elon Musk is. He said he's so ugly. The reason why he's ugly is because every time he sells a car, um, Elon Musk gets his dick sucked. 
and so he's like he's so depleted of semen he doesn't even have a drop of semen in him that's why he's so ugly <laughs> and i don't believe i don't believe in semen retention any of that i don't think that's credible science but back to your but back to the choice i don't think you really answered the question if some ugly bra uh was like larry uh this six months and i know the baby is yours and i'm gonna keep it uh would you encourage her to have an abortion or not and if she doesn't have an abortion you're going to see that kid if i laid with her and she's going to have my child i have to somehow be in that child's life in some form or fashion it's my child that's my seed i can't i can't deny them that they are i mean yeah you can oh no that's not my kid i'm out I, i'm doing other things leave me alone i can do that but i don't think that that's the right thing to do i am denying that child to the fullest unless i hear tell of some sort of uh athletic ability <laughs> in or around <laughs> the age of 16 or 17 years old <laughs> then i will reunite that's with the mother that's typical what otherwise is... i I do not. I have disavowed knowledge. Oh man, that's difficult. I can't. I can't. I can't do that. Oh, no, I'm all for financial abortions. I think that men should have more rights in the sexual marketplace. Just because she got pregnant and decided to have a, a baby doesn't obligate me to do anything. She is in under no obligation of uh, towards motherhood, and nobody even makes it a moral quandary. They can abort these kids. They can abandon them at the fire station on the way to the club. And nobody says shit. But if I don't want to be bothered, oh, no, I'm a bad guy. Fuck y'all. I'm not paying any money I don't, ha I don't have to pay. I'm not going to see no kids I don't want. She made her decision to be a mother. Cool. That doesn't obligate me to be a father. here tiktok let me see let me let me go into tiktok and pull up the uh the asian woman who's talking about racism she does such a fine job of such a fine job of explaining you know our modern society why it is the way that it is does a great job with it let's see just downloaded the what is that app called um tiktok she's on tiktok Amy Chin, I believe is her name. All right. Let's turn that down. Uh oh. I'm in. I'm into the world of uh, what's that thing called? TikTok. Ah, oh, there she is. Yes, this is really important. Asian Americans were redlined from opening businesses in white neighborhoods because white people didn't want Asian Americans operating in their yes, neighborhoods and didn't want Asian Americans profiting off of white people. But because the positionality of Asian Americans is weaponized to oppress black people, Asian Americans were being given loans to open businesses in black communities, even though black people were not able to receive loans to open businesses in their own communities. And as I've said before, as a result of of this black wealth is essentially paid out twice when it goes to Asian American businesses, once when the individual pays for the goods or services, and then again when the Asian American business owner removes the profit from the community. Because usually people open businesses in their own communities, and this is mutually beneficial, where the business owner is making a livelihood off of providing goods and services to their community, and by being a member of the community, they're contributing and they're investing back into the community. This is an ideal situation, and that is not what happens with Asian American businesses operating in black communities. Yeah, about that. yeah. Um, <clears throat> most uh, Asian business owners are racist, honorary scumbags who uh, take money out of the community and run and won't even give you an extra fucking duck sauce and don't contribute anything uh, to the community other than uh, bad attitudes and shit products. Just like, uh, what was that girl's name? Teresa Hawkins? That, that Korean killed? Uh, Latasha Har uh, Harlan. Latasha Harlan. There you go. Uh, rest in peace to the young sister who got killed over some orange juice. From that day on, 
all these useless fucking gang bangers <clears throat> should have uh, had a green light on all these fucking non-black owned uh, businesses in the community. They should be scared to even open up uh, in the black community and not be 100% contributory. They don't do shit. They don't sponsor Little League. They don't do anything. And they got a bad, and they've they've gotten to the point where they are active with a bad attitude, just bad service. Let me stop you there. You lost me. You lost me with your point when you said these useless gang members, because you know we're in Los Angeles. the The history of of gang banging, for better or for worse, is real. A brother who who would hear this conversation would be like, you know, sadly they were like, man, it's a green light on that dude you know forget him you know by what you're saying please please be a little bit more kind with your words but you could be just as as poignant and um okay how about this let's eloquent let's, let's remix it then but let's not say let's um the violent black male subculture of la should be more proactive in policing who does business in the community hell yeah now, now you now that's a point now that's a point that a lot of people have made the the gang members want to you know pick up guns they should be very much uh, in the fight for our our community's liberation and put those guns against the people who really are degrading our communities because the gang members are the warriors. That's they the are van- not warriors. That's the vanguard. They're not the vanguard. Absolutely yes, not. There, there has been a, a devolution where absolutely not. at one time, you know, the Crips were community redevelopment in if, progress. If, if, but, if an organization has been around for 60 years and four years of it has been positive <laughs> and 56 years has been bullshit, bullshit organization. You can't talk about, well, four, the first four years was cool. Yeah, okay. You're talking about less than 10% of the fucking time. What they've been up to mostly for the last 50, 60 years. Now, what about the... Well, well then, let's not blame... Let's not blame... Put blame on anyone. Let's not do that. But let's talk about... Let's talk, let's talk about Justin. And what, what's crazy Tennessee. to me... I don't, I don't care about it. What, what's crazy to me is... Some Korean Ajima died uh, in her store around here, and niggas was out there crying, and they was going to, and, and and they lined up to go to her funeral. I'm like, these West Coast niggas is the worst. I, I don't I don't remember the exact name of the woman, but it was like some Korean lady who had uh, run some exploitive store out of her sweatshop on some corner in LA for like two decades and when the bitch finally killed over these niggas was sad about it I have no idea what you're talking about yeah I'm, yeah, I'm sorry it's just some like random story I, I read about this horrible city um I'm glad that Amy Chin has uh, shed light on this because when I made my video in 2014 about the Korean community I, I, I thought, I thought that I was touching on what she was, um, what she was talking, what she was talking about, but I didn't explain. I didn't go into detail. What I wanted to say at that time, what I should have said, is that as something that Amy Chen has um, already described. I'm not sure she described it in this one, but she said that the the Asian community was 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 a buffer. Or it was a it was a an insulation an insulatory community between blacks and whites. Maybe maybe that's exactly what she said here. She said that Asians could not sell their wares in white communities, and so they were relegated to selling to blacks. And then by selling to blacks they were able to get business loans they were able to take up the position that blacks could otherwise benefit from in america i will say this 
to progress themselves but the war is against black and white and so because whites didn't want blacks progressing then come on in asians take their spots take well, their positions here's the back. thing it's not even asian this immigration has never benefited black america immigration has always been about bringing in hostile uh uh foreign class hostile foreigners uh to keep black people out of jobs for example if we go back to the american revolutionary war before there was an america crispus addicts was on the docks why because he was protesting what was he protesting he was protesting that British soldiers were moonlight on the docks and they would take lower wages. So you had immigrants undermining his ability to work. That is what he was mad about. That is why he was there and he was killed for it. So from day before there was Amer in America, we have had this problem. We had the problem with the Irish. The Irish went around lynching black people during the uh, civil war. Uh, the lead up to the Civil War with the uh, drafts in New York City and Boston. We've had the problem with the Italians, the Polish, the Jews, every single group. It's the same cycle. The uh, Asians who went, who were down south, they would write letters to the uh, the governor espousing the same racial rhetoric that the whites did, the same anti-black rhetoric. So each group takes on the same hostile attitudes towards us. That's why, as far as I'm concerned, we should, and, and now you have the Mexicans and they have hunter killer groups in LA. They, they're doing ethnic cleansing in some of these neighborhoods. Why should black Americans be subjected to these immigrant groups? What do we get? We get nothing for it and they're racially hostile. Would, would we have immigration as it is if uh, you're bringing in a million hostile Mexicans to, that were hostile towards white people. They wouldn't allow that in a million years. Those bo the borders would be iron curtains. But because uh, they're poor and they compete with jobs with uh, poor black people and they're hostile to black people and they love white people, yeah, we'll let them in. The second generation, we'll let them be cops and we'll let them beat on black people, kill black people. Go look at the city of Miami, second generation Cubans. How do those black people getting treated down there? It's, it's all the same story. But see, we don't have a real uh, political, we, we, we haven't had political uh, representation in 60 years to say, hey, why do we need these immigrants? I would even go so far as to say the, uh, the African immigrants. The Caribbean immigrants are anti-foundational black American. All right, we're going to stop it there, but we're going to continue with that, that, that question right there or that, uh, that statement right there. Right now. One, two, one, two. Welcome to an IC 10 9 podcast. Uh, I am your host, Larry Wiggs, with my in studio guest, Big Mike. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. So, we got the next uh, 29, about 25 minutes. So, to talk about some things on this uh, Saturday uh, afternoon in Inglewood, California. We just got back from a visit to Snoop Dogg's shop for the first time. Although I've been in uh, Inglewood now for over a month, maybe a month and a half, uh, maybe two months, more, almost almost two months. I've, I've never been to that shop until today. Yeah, um, we went to one shop. Is that there... It's uh, maybe five or six door plaza, and they have more security guards armed than open shops. <laughs> Two of the shops are owned by Snoop Dogg or Snoop Dogg affiliated companies. The first shop had two armed guards, and they were selling Funkos out of there. If you don't know what a Funko is, it's like a four inch plastic doll with an exaggeratedly large head. 
and it's usually of something from the pop culture like Guardians of the Galaxy or Marvel or pop icons like uh, Britney Spears and Snoop Dogg and whatnot. And those are all well and good, but just between the workers and the armed security, Esther would have to be doing like $200 an hour. So I don't understand how it stays in business. Who could possibly want a Funko that bad that you would go to this store and buy this nonsense? They also sold uh, like some sort of weird pop with Snoop Dogg's name on it and but it, whatnot. It wasn't a pop, actually. It was a canister that did not, it didn't contain um, liquid in it. It was a, there was another idol, another doll inside of it. Oh my God, what a waste of time. <laughs> I would have been so angry if I was like, okay, well, let me get at least a refreshing drink out of this nonsense <laughs> store. And I open it, and it's another picture of him. And it, it, uh, what else did they have in there? You know, they had uh, they had like uh, this uh, giant LeBron James you could uh, take a picture next to, and, uh, and a giant Snoop Dogg you could take a picture under and whatnot. Uh, so I'm, but my whole thing is, why do you need two armed guards for this nonsense? Because the store says on the door, there's no money in here. And you could steal everything in that store and you wouldn't be able to sell it on eBay in a thousand years. So, oh my God. Uh, I, it, seems, it seems pointless. It, it'd be like uh, putting armed guards next to a sewer. Like, <laughs> then we went down to the other store. And the other store was a little better, actually, because it, it, he sold like just regular merchandise. So you could buy the Snoop Dogg cookbook. You, if you, for some reason, felt the need to dress like Snoop Dogg, you could buy his old like Super Bowl outfit, uh, those uh, ridiculous head wraps he wears, him and his wife from the broadest no, no, line. No, no, no. Those are not ridiculous. Those, those are terrible. Those are necessary those are if you have long hair. Those are garbage. But anyway. Those are... I, I actually considered um, picking up one. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that that's, would have made fun of you. The utility uh, value in that There's, is actually there's nothing high. valuable in that store. And if you spent $250, you got a free gift. And there's some guy arguing that he spent $150 and like $100 at the same, during the same trip, but not at the same exact time. So he didn't get the free uh, gift whatever it was I wasn't paying attention to that but that's interesting but they had this monster security guard this guy you know I, I do I do think you should go to his store just to look at this nigga <laughs> he was like six foot eight a thousand pounds how tall are you jet black and his he had like a size 20 new balance black security guard shoe and his hands was as big as catcher's mint and he was eating fried chicken at the door that's the, that's part of the paycheck right there the i think they paid that nigga in fried chicken that's what they used to do it on, on soul train the soul train dancers would go up in hollywood they would dance all for uh, all day and then they get paid in fried chicken don cornelius made sure they got fried chicken biscuits and whatever but again he was very generous right so how tall are you I'm six one, and so this man stood taller than you. So you said what? How, how tall was he? He was a genetic freak. <laughs> he was six foot thousand, and he weighed nine hundred pounds, and he had jet black bloodshot eyes, and he was like a friendly monster. Interesting that you would that you would describe his eyes as blood bloodshot. They were bloodshot and black. They said. Um, they described uh, Jesus as having, uh, you know, red, fiery eyes. And when you, when I see a black man, whether in Africa or wherever, with red eyes, I think automatically of Jesus. I think of high blood pressure. <laughs> Someone told me, no, it, it, the red, Jesus' red eyes, Jesus' eyes were red because he smoked weed. Oh my God, one of these degenerate West Coast people? <laughs> yes. One of these West Coast, did you, you know Jesus was on weed, right? Think about it. Who else would need to turn water into wine? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who else would hang out with 12 broke dudes? <laughs> Who else would need to take one bag of fish and some 
old bread and feed everybody. Oh. Jesus was on weed. Oh my God. Yeah, West Coast degenerates. Oh this whole, man. This whole state is just. So. I'll be glad when it goes into the ocean. So, Mike, you're from uh, Ohio. I am. And when you when you're in Los Angeles, I take you under my wing and try to show you. You put me city. in danger everywhere we go. Uh, when we leave, we go. You know that was a uh, Rolling Sixties Crip neighborhood, right? <laughs> like what? <laughs> I don't. Put you're him. in danger. I, I try to inform him. I try to let him know that these are these are just be aware of your surroundings and know where which part what part of the city you're in yeah we see all kind of idiotic gang members like we were in uh this one place called tax uh horrible uh breakfast food place Ooh. and then this guy comes in with his son and he has a whole face on the back of his head i was later informed that that face was wearing a uh red bandana signifying that he was a, a gang member and I'm like oh that's that's great real good look there I hate coming to LA by the way it's, it's such a like cause whenever I, I come up here I only come up here like once I, like, I haven't been up here in a year so I, I come up here but I, the reason why I don't come is I think psychologically I just resent having to figure out what I'm going to wear based on what some ignorant nigga <laughs> might not like so oh, man. I can't I can't wrap my mind around coming up here too often, changing my wardrobe. Um, oh, then we went to this black-owned restaurant. It was a, a guy who who came to L.A. to sell hot dogs, and he got so good at it that he was able to open up an entire store of hot dogs. So, you know, I was like, that's an impressive feat. Earl's Earl and then we we left Earl's and we went some uh, we went to this uh we went to this like natural holistic store and you know they had like all the holistic stuff it was very nice but in the back they they, they made crack they had a whole rush they had a whole production thing in the back that said employees uh only keep out we make crack back here I'm Larry Wiggs. This is the IC109 podcast, and I do not support or endorse this message. This is solely and wholly uh, the opinions the, of IC109 no. and the late great Nipsey Hussle. No. Uh uh-uh. uh. Uh Big Mike is enjoying just, you know, shitting on people and, and things. Oh, I'm not shitting on anything. I told you I enjoyed the holistic uh, spot. I got a uh simply wholesome. A coconut and pineapple and honey and they put something else in it, uh shake, and it was delicious. And fellas, if you wanna see some thoroughbreds and leggings hang out at this spot like simply wholesome like it was a uh, it was this one light skinned woman and she was holding and then uh, it was another one she was uh, I think she was some she was some rapper's wife or something you could just tell she looked expensive and she was driving a Porsche truck and she was bad and then when we was walking out three Deltas came in Zeta uh, Zetas Zeta. and in most places Zetas are very fat I've never seen thin Zetas before. It was three bad ones. And I was like, did, did y'all not have the money to be AKAs or something? I don't know. Wait a minute. So I'm, I don't know about Zetas. I, I'm familiar with the AKAs. My sister is an AKA. Oh, by the way, if you ever get to look at uh, Larry's sister. <laughs> <laughs> look, my uh, my sister is an AKA and all of her friends. Light skin beautiful um sisters all of them from um spelman cops but the akas i know of and then the deltas uh delta sigma theta is the uh the women's uh sorority that is as popular delta sigma theta and uh alpha kappa alpha aka those two i don't know anything about any zetas never heard of zetas in, in cleveland the zetas were uh most oh. chicks oh cleveland has the the zeta but uh well wait a minute you had an opportunity to just stop them all and say hey y'all from cleveland welcome to simply wholesome why would, why, why would why would they be from cleveland well you said because zetas you know this is a national people. chapter man i've never it's a national them. organization never heard of them. they have local zetas there would be no reason for me to assume they're from cleveland what is it called what's the whole thing i don't know zeta i, I don't i'm not a greek person though I'm, I'm I wasn't. Either. I was not allowed to be an alpha. They, they kicked me out. Uh, A five A. Yes. 
they have I think the headquarters or something like A five eight right here in LA in um, off of Fifty Fourth Street. A five eight Alpha Black and Gold. Yeah, they they Fifty um, Fourth Street. They didn't allow me to become an Alpha. Hmm. Man, getting arrested in international countries. That's what it was. No, this is when I was in my twenties. Yeah. Uh, when I was in the uh, undergrad and. Uh, Basically, you know, I'm how I am on this podcast is how I am in real life, and they basically didn't really, they didn't really enjoy that. So. It sure is. So they uh, they didn't allow me to progress. No hard feelings. Man. But uh, let's see, what else did we do? So we went to Simply Wholesome. Yes. Uh, Shout out to Mia. Thank you for allowing us to uh, record uh, again. I'm Larry Wiggs, and this is my voice, and I want to say thank you to Mia and the staff at uh, Simply Wholesome for, well, thank you, Mia, for giving us your blessing to film there. And thank you for all the ladies wearing them leggings, God damn. Fellas, you got to go up there and just, like, post up, just get you a drink, and, like, just hit on the women that walk by you. Like, if you sit on the one thing, on the one side, when they line up, they got to stand next to you for a minute, so just stand there and just shoot your shot. Um, as I mentioned before, be aware of your surroundings. Um, Simply Wholesome may not be the place to hit on women. Uh, a lot of the women who go there are married. Are gang affiliated. <laughs> possibly. Possibly that too. A lot of them are crips. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you are aware of your location, and things, that's Slauson. That, we were on Slauson. And Slauson is home. Or I mean, Nipsey made Slauson uh, famous. Slauson boy, you know, Crenshaw and Slauson. One day they'll gentrify all of that and you won't have to worry about anything. They're going to gentrify their way into safety. Don't worry about it. Every day, more and more white women are jogging by in yoga pants and it becomes safer and safer. Scary thought. That area, uh, although it there is a billboard that does uh, designate it as uh, Black Beverly Hills by a black owned uh, attire clothing um, brand. Um, you know, years ago, within the last 25 years, it was 80% black. Today, somewhere probably like maybe 50%, maybe even less. They need to get it to 6% black and get rid of all of those uh, gentlemen who like to engage in illegal activities so that we can walk free as citizens and wear the color of clothing that we want unmolested by childish adults well let's see um yeah things have changed in the community oh okay yeah jerusalem chicken is over there that's what that's that place oh oh i was gonna say uh simply wholesome is where they filmed you people and yeah you have to see that no i don't because here's the thing I saw the commercial, and first of all, I'm not for it. It's, I, I could just tell it was dumb, and yeah. So you know what? That's a good point because I'm watching it, and I'm I'm saying to myself, okay, this is a um, Jonah Hill plays a character from Brentwood. Remember when we took that trip out to the hills, and when you know you saw those palatial homes and exactly stuff? beautiful. Now, Brentwood and Inglewood. Windsor Hills I don't think that we really I mean in my personal experience I really had never been to Brentwood I never spent any time there I did have some friends uh, some white friends who lived in the Hollywood Hills but I'm but I'm basically saying the Brent the Brentwood experience the Brentwood experience is far removed from the Black Beverly Hills experience and to believe that someone from Brentwood and someone from Black Beverly Hills, you know, got together. That is quite unbelievable. And um, although it's possible. Here, okay, I don't know your city, so here's my uneducated opinion. I would think that something like that would only happen in like certain instances. Like, mo to me, the city is bifurcated. Like you say, there's the Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills plays the wood, the Woodland Hills, the uh, Calabasas, those are separate enclaves yes. that have very little to do with the people who live in 
or nothing to do actually with the people that, that live in South Central LA, right? And Watts and Compton and all of that. And so, the and the freeways were built to get them from one part of the city to the other without interacting with them. Exactly. So, for an interaction to happen, it would have to be in a specific context, like mm-hmm. USC or UCLA, like at college or at at a university, or um, well. Somebody, the, if you're not gonna see the story, I'll just tell you. There's a moment where I'll never watch that story. Where that where uh, Lauren London's uh, character um, goes. If she to, hustles X Y one oh nine. Get it in there. You're at 109 right now. So, um, Lauren London's character is picking up. Uh, no, no, no. She was actually in the neighborhood, Century City. Excuse me. They meet in Century City. Century City is midway between uh, Brentwood and black beverly hills essentially and lauren london's character was called to that location and jonah hill's character mistakes lauren london's character for an for his uber driver and he gets in the backseat of her car and that's how they meet she's offended and she's upset how the how dare you get in my car etc etc and jonah hill's like but you look like my uh uber driver and she's like, oh, well, you think every black woman looks like whatever? He shows a picture of her, and the, the joke is, damn, she does look like me. She's, you know, fair skin, hair styled in a similar fashion. Anyhow, that's where they that's where they meet. But, like, I don't know. I forgot why she was in Century City. But why, why would she find him attractive, though? Because, like... He's fat and slovenly looking and not facially attractive. So why would it go any further than that? And if it was a black man and a, a Jewish woman, cops would have been called. <laughs> the, the movie would have been over because he would have been killed. That's a sad, sad reality that so, like, it recently, you know, what, February, January or February earlier this year, the young black dude was uh, killed on uh, Venice Boulevard um, in Santa Monica that's not far from here he's a young guy and he, he was he was in distress and he was talking about uh, people were chasing him or something and the police instead of trying to help him understand the situation and, and just really not caring or excuse me not perceiving him as a threat they tasered him they tasered him so many times numerous times that he died from being tasered uh hours after you know while in police custody i believe and and that that was a very scary uh story right here in los angeles because i drive these streets and the last thing that i think of is you know police brutality although it does occur and i hear lots of stories outside of california still california has a very rich history of police brutality of uh, racism, yeah, it's just horrible. I mean, I, I have a couple things, couple thoughts on that. First off, I work in a hospital, and the cops never make it better. Like the cops get called because they have uh, powers that other people don't inside the hospital. But these aren't smart people. They generally aren't college educated. Uh, they are, you know prone to violence so I would only call to me if you call the cops on somebody it's because you want them dead I would never call the cops for any reason but in terms of LA LA, the original uh, not the original police department of course but like the uh, police commissioners in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s they used to recruit southern white men to become LAPD officers because they wanted people who were uh, who had a history of uh, antagonism towards black Americans. They wanted head crackers. Yep. And then you have the uh, LA Sheriff's Department which is filled with white and Hispanic gangs. They have actual gang members. And then some of those gangs, the way you were initiated is through violence against black men. It's no different and uh, the Japanese uh, under sheriff, or whatever you call the second or third command, uh, 
one of his uh, he got it. He got he did something violent to somebody, and they covered for him. And that's how he was like initiated into the the inner workings of the sheriff department. And now he's number three. But all of these groups that you bring in, these Mexicans, uh, the Asians, there, and they are uh, racially hostile people. All right, we're gonna end this one, this uh, this segment, this episode right here. Um, any idea what we're gonna call it? Or what what are call your final it, they thoughts? Do, they they sell or uh, go to um, wholesome foods or what was that called? Simply wholesome. Simply wholesome, and um, look at the women. Peace. You're at 109 right now.